back on. Thank you. The scripture reading for this week is found in Ruth chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech. His wife's name was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephratites from Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to Moab to live there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah, the other Ruth. After they had lived there about ten years, both Malon and Kilion also died. And Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. Thank you, Bruce. Well, excited to be back in the pulpit and um, excited to be in a new series, Ruth. We're going to be going through Ruth uh, verse by verse for the next six weeks. Really uh, exciting book because God shows up in the places you least expect him to when you're reading Ruth, and, and we'll kind of get a, a little uh, overview of that this evening. But these first five verses of Ruth serve as a prologue to the rest of the book. They set us up to see particular despair so that we will see all the more of the Lord's magnificent provision in the end. Um, scripture up to this point, if you read chronologically, um, God's people are always traveling place to place. The narrators use geography as symbols to show different themes of remembrance. But Ruth is unique, this book, because everything happens in Bethlehem. As we read in verse 1, a man from Bethlehem went to Moab, but we'll find that the narrative does not get picked up until Naomi comes back to Bethlehem. So what then is the purpose of this prologue, these first five verses? If the story doesn't pick up until Naomi settles in Bethlehem, why these quick details about Elimelech traveling to Moab? It's to show us that nothing good happens when we leave the place that God has promised to work. Nothing good happens when we leave the place that God has called us to be. We will find nothing helpful anywhere else apart from the Lord. Have you had this experience? Maybe you thought the grass was greener on the other side, and so you packed everything up to go there, only to find that once you get settled, actually, it's not so green as you thought, and maybe you regretted leaving at all. Perhaps it was a change in your job. You moved. You change your education plan. Maybe you, were left, you left the relationship for another, or you changed where you went to church, or perhaps you changed that you went to church at all. What happened to Elimelech is nothing new. It's a phenomenon of life that continues to be experienced by people today, and it is experienced in many other ways. So, so let's look a little bit more of what happened in Elimelech's life so that we can learn how God works, so that we can respond rightly to our God and experience the joy and the peace that are only found where he is. The book begins with this phrase, in the days when the judges ruled. Now, this is a reference to the book of Judges that comes right before in our English Bibles, the book of Ruth. It was a time in Israel's history of incredible dysfunction. Constant back and forth between bondage and liberation. It was littered with um, oppression from other nations. At times we see the nation of Israel joyously worshiping other gods besides the Lord. We see lots of warfare and bloodshed. There was essentially no certainty of life if you lived in Israel In the times of judges, they lived in constant extremes, either totally depending on the Lord or utterly forsaking the Lord. 
Verse 1 continues, and there was famine in the land. Now, in the Lord's covenant with the Israelites under Moses, he lists famine as a pending judgment he would send on his people if they were to forsake him for other gods. So in light of the covenant that they're under, it's not a stretch to see the famine mentioned here in Ruth as judgment from God, especially in light of the fact that this is happening in the time of the judges. Need I remind you, the book of Judges ends with this sobering verse. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Well, next, the narrator gives more detail than necessary. He could have just said, and the limit left Judah for Moab, one nation for another nation. But instead, he gives us the name of the town, the little town. Why? Bethlehem means house of bread. That's, the, that's Beth is house, Lehem, bread, house of bread. This amplifies the despair that has fallen on Elimelech. He left the house of bread because it didn't have so much as crumbs to give her people. Now, Elimelech was just an example of the foolish regret and dysfunction that we see happening all through the Israelites um, time and again in the book of Judges as they forsake and forget the Lord. Perhaps Elimelech intended to bring his family back. I don't want to be too hard on him. I don't know his intentions. But he dies in Moab. The narrator makes this seem abrupt and doesn't continue saying anything more about him. At any rate, Elimelech's sons bring the folly of their father to a new level. They marry foreign wives, which, again, under the covenant that they're under, that is prohibited, strictly prohibited, and is seen itself as a sign of judgment. Well, not only was famine seen as judgment, but barrenness was a curse. Elimelech's sons were married for 10 years and died, never able to have children. I'm, I'm sure they found food in Moab after all. They lived 10 years, but they couldn't keep their life. This all leaves Naomi as good as her dead husband and sons, without anyone to provide for her and no one to protect her. Now, the problem was not that Elimelech left a place of famine in order to find some food. That wasn't the problem. It was deeper than that. He had forsaken the Lord's promised means to work. In the same passage of Deuteronomy that says that famine would be judgment on his people, the Lord says the solution, repent, and I will provide. I will deliver you if you repent. Yet Elimelech did what was right in his own eyes, leaving the land the Lord promised to bless his people and settling in a foreign nation that had foreign gods. Nothing good happens when we forsake the place that the Lord has promised to work. Nothing good happens when we forsake the place that the Lord has called us to be. Well, how will Naomi get out of this predicament? That's what we're going to see the next few weeks. How will the Lord provide? You know what a good story is all about uh, when you compare the beginning of the story with the ending of the story. How is the, how is the, the author setting us up to see resolution in the end? So I'm going to spoil a couple things for you about Ruth, okay? First, when her sons died, Naomi was left without any children. The author uses that intentional word, children. But fast forward to the end of the book. Ruth, her daughter-in-law, has a son. But the author says, Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him, and the women living there says, Naomi has had a son. But there's a second and closely related theme in the book of Ruth. The point isn't merely that Naomi doesn't have a son. The point is more about Israel receiving a king. As one commentator writes, the story opens with Elimelech, whose name means my God is king. And it ends with a genealogy that climaxes in King David. David is the answer to this pivotal problem we see in Judges that Israel had no king. So the issue, issue of barrenness was not 
merely an issue of missing out on the joy of having children. This certainly was difficult for Naomi, but the issue was regarding God's promise to his, to his people to raise up deliverers for them and to give them a Messiah king who would come through being born among the Israelites. So we're set up to ask, will God's purposes stand true? How will God turn things around? You and I wonder these same things today all the time in our lives as Christians. We wonder these same things in our life as a church. Has God forgotten me? Has God forgotten us? I thought he had a plan for my life, but now I'm not so sure. If he does, how will he turn things around and when? As a church member, you might be thinking, and I've been asked this, Pastor Ethan, where are we going as a church? Well, we're finally coming out of COVID. A new pastor's come. Some people have left. Will new people come? If God has a plan for us, how will he turn things around? Uh, some of you have met my grandmother. She came to the installation service a few months back. She is a very gentle and kind spirit. But her convictions are firm. I'll never forget being a young child, my grandmother looking at me gravely and saying, I don't believe in luck. I thought, what's the big deal with believing in luck? Does she think it's superstitious or something? But she explained, I don't believe in luck because I believe in the providence of God. That was a new word for me. The providence of God is something we believe in Forest Dale Church. You can read it on what we believe on our website. We believe in God's work of creation, providence, and redemption. So what is the providence of God? Well, I, I, I like this one the best. A Reformed Dutch catechism from the 16th century explains it beautifully. So that this is the Heidelberg Catechism. Ask, ask, these old, uh, ask these little Dutch children this question, and they'll tell you. What do you understand by the providence of God? They'll say, a uh, providence is the almighty and ever-present power of God by which he upholds as with his hand heaven and earth and all creatures, and so rules them that leaf and blade, rain and drought, fruitful and lean years, food and drink, health, sickness, prosperity and poverty all things in fact come to us not by chance but from his fatherly hand isn't that good news providence is often contrasted with miracle having miracle referring to god's work through supernatural means and providence referring to god's work through natural or ordinary means we'll see this throughout the book of ruth here's my definition his providence, God's sovereign power to accomplish his perfect plan through the circumstances of ordinary life. The providence of God teaches us what the Apostle James says, that every good and perfect gift comes from above. Pastor John Piper wrote a massive book that I've been reading for months, maybe a year now, halfway through, called Providence. He needs 700 pages just to, just to show us all the providence of God throughout Scripture from Genesis to Revelation. Here's some examples of Scripture. Job said, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Jesus said in Matthew 5, the Father causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. He's talking about ordinary things like a rising sun or falling rain. Ultimately, as from God's own fatherly hand. The Apostle Paul writes in Romans 8, 28, I probably say this verse every other week, God works all things together for the good of those who love him, for those who are called according to his purpose. Even in the death of Jesus, we see the providence of God at work. Although God sent Jesus by a miracle, being born of a virgin, he saved us by the work of providence. 
an ordinary death on a cross by crucifixion under Roman guards. Over and above and in and through the ordinary circumstances of life, there is a sovereign God working out all of these things to accomplish his perfect plan for the glory of his name and the good of his people. Here's a couple examples that we'll see in Ruth. From, for our passage next week, next Sunday, verse 6. When Naomi heard, when she was in Moab, she heard that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them. So we might think, oh, the Lord's providing food for them. Maybe he's sending manna from heaven. Maybe an angel has appeared. Maybe a prophet has come out of the wilderness to speak when it comes to the work of God, we often, our knee-jerk reaction is th to think of miracle, but what does the author say here? So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. The providence of God, working through something as ordinary as the seasons of the year. We can easily anticipate God's work in the miraculous only to foolishly overlook God's work in the ordinary. Here's just one more example. Ruth chapter 2. Ruth went out, entered a field, and began to glean behind the harvest harvesters. As it turned out, the author writes, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech, as it turned out. The author here is being modest setting us up to see the providence of God at work in the unassuming, ordinary, everyday things of life. In a world where a sovereign God reigns over all, there is no such thing as luck. And because the Lord is sovereign over everything, everywhere, we can trust him right where we are. If you're looking for the main takeaway, that's it. Because the Lord is sovereign everywhere, we can trust him right where we are. So let's close by asking, what does it mean for us to trust the Lord right where we are? Well, if you're not a, a Christian, we're happy you're here. Uh, we don't check IDs at the door. We're happy you're here. You're always welcome. What does it mean for you to trust the Lord right where you are? Well, you're like Elimelech, wandering from place to place, searching for the bread of life, trying to find something to satisfy the hunger of your soul, but you need to stop and trust the Lord right where you are. What does it mean for you to do that? It means for you to come to Jesus just as you are. Stop looking for other things, other people, hobbies, commitments to be something that will give you ultimate satisfaction and rest. They never can, they never will come to Jesus, the living water and bread of life, and come to Jesus just as you are. Yes, I'm not going to keep any secrets from, from you. Jesus will radically change your life if you come to him. But in order to come to Jesus and receive him as he is, you have to come to him just as you are. Here's why. Because we need Jesus for all that he is. We can't bring any of us with, with us. And we can trust the Lord right where we are because the Lord sent Jesus to receive us just as we are. We read in Romans 5, God demonstrates his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Verse 10, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. So Jesus says in Matthew 11, come to me, come to me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden. I think that's the King James Version, it's just in my head, sorry. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart. You will find rest for your souls if you come to me. It is a grave mistake to wait to come to Jesus until 
you clean yourself up first. Why? Because all our righteousness, all our cleanness must be found in Jesus. Therefore, don't try to acquire righteousness, whatever you do, first, before coming to Jesus. And all our rest must be found in him. So don't try to find rest in yourself or anything else. First, before you come to Jesus, you and I can find neither righteousness nor rest in anywhere else outside of Jesus, as, if we're honest, our whole lives have already proved time and again. I love how one pastor put it, Dane Ortland. He says that when we invite you, neighbor, friend, non-Christian person, when we invite you to life together in the church, what people often hear us saying, and by the way, if you're a believer and you're inviting someone to church, no, this is what they're hearing you say. People often hear us saying, Dane Ortland says, would you like co to come and do religion with me? Would you like to come with me and stop being bad and start being good? But actually, what we're inviting you into and what the gospel declares is an invitation to trade in all our good and our bad to be free. Thank you, Dane Ortland, for that insight. So, would you trade in all your good and all your bad to be free? Come to Jesus just as you are. Trust the Lord right where you are. Receive and rest in Christ alone for salvation. Now, for those of you who have received and are resting in Christ alone for salvation, if you're a Christian, is there a relationship you want out of? Is there a job you no longer want? Is there another place or circumstance of life that you would rather be in? Well, I, I can't tell you from Ruth chapters 1, verses 1 through 5, whether or not you should stay or go. God's word doesn't work like that. But at least while you wait, would you trust the Lord right where you are? Would you acknowledge God as the Lord of all creation, who upholds all things by his sovereign providence? Would you acknowledge that? And would you believe again that he knows where you are? He knows your circumstance, and he's committed himself to you by his covenant with Christ to provide you everything you need to be faithful in your calling right where you are. I'm not saying whether you should stay or go. I'm just saying you can trust the Lord right where you are. Recently, Catherine and I had friends stay with us for a few days. Their youngest son was perhaps four years old, and his mother, Cassie, was complaining to us about certain kids' movies. She said, they sing songs about following your heart, and I have to tell my son, no, don't follow your heart. It's desperately wicked. Now, that's not her opinion. She's just quoting the prophet Jeremiah follow your heart? Let's, let's be real. As if you've never let yourself down. No, follow God's word, which tells you exactly where you should be in his presence together with his people. The Apostle Paul outlines this in Ephesians chapter 2. The first half he's telling us how we've uh, become a Christian. We've been made alive by the Holy Spirit and in the end of chapter 2, how the Spirit of God has united us together with his people, Christ's body, the church, where it is that we fulfill our calling in Christ Jesus to do the good works God has prepared in advance for us to do, Ephesians 2, verse 10. He writes, the result of our redemption is this, verse 19, that we are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone, and in Christ the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. In him you two are being built together 
as a dwelling place in which God lives by his spirit. So we can at least rule out one thing. In the Christian faith, isolation is never a legitimate option. It goes against our calling as Christians, and also it goes against the work of redemption that the Spirit has brought in our life. When times are tough, it's tempting to drift away, but hang on and trust the Lord right where you are in His presence with His people. Finally, as a church, as a church, what does it mean for us to trust the Lord right where we are? In the 90s, that was my day. Uh, Willow Creek Community Church in Chicago, pastored by Bill Hybels. It was one of the fastest growing churches in America. They turned church methods on its head and revolutionized their influence like never before. And after 10 years of expansive growth, growth Pastor Bill Hybels and a team of researchers started a three-year study to track the spiritual growth they've experienced and to measure it the results though startled them and caused them to reverse course and to go back to the basics they had forsaken they published their study i have it in my office and one of the main assumptions that they said that they were operating under during that time was this have you ever thought this before that the more energy a Christian put into the activities of the church, the more they would grow in their love for God. It sounds okay. But their research showed, quote, an increasing level of activities did not predict an increasing love for God. Rather, they discovered that an increasing love for God is determined by one's relationship with Jesus. Pastor Bill Hybels concluded, quote, This study has caused me to see clearly that the church and its myriad of programs have taken on too much of the responsibility for people's spiritual growth. Now, with all the outward measures of success that would excite and encourage any one of us, they changed their minds, realizing they had it all wrong. One pastor put it this way, We're called to make disciples. Discipleship culture, though, is not volunteer culture. And that's what he learned at his church, too, in Australia. Well, as a church, so then what does it mean for us to trust the Lord right where we are? It means for us to continue to rely on the, the means that God has promised to work in, never to abandon it for methods, regardless of the mirage of growth that they display. So where, then, has God promised to work? Well, the Lord walks his people through this conversation in Isaiah chapter 55. He says, why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Why are you doing these things that leave you empty? Who cares if they look impressive and draw large crowds if the result is you are left no more mature in your love for the Lord? Verse 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. He's saying, come to me. I have the solution for you. But he continues, keep this in mind, folks. Verse 8, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways aren't your ways. In other words, you'll be tempted to doubt what I'm about to say. Because sometimes it's not going to appear to be working very well. Verse 10, as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return um, it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. Here it is, verse 11. So is my word that goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. The solution the Lord proposes to restore his people is his word, the proclamation of his word. And what is the result of this work? Verse 12, you will go out in joy and be led forth, forth with peace. And you know about these um, clapping trees, right? Verse 13, the apostle Paul called this the foolishness of preaching. 
as a church, we can leave the means that God has promised to use for places that God never promised to show up. We will always be tempted to leave greener, uh, for greener pastures elsewhere. Christians change churches. Churches change methods. But where has God promised to work? Through his word. As it is, through his Christ-exalting, spirit-inspired word that he has promised both to create faith and to strengthen faith. After all, it is that through hearing, faith comes. Faith comes through hearing. Through the word, the message about Christ, Romans 10, 17. Elimelech left for Bethlehem, left Bethlehem for Moab. But sure enough, in time, word came to Naomi that the Lord was providing for his people in the very place they had just left. And it's only when she returns, we'll begin next week, that she can then finally participate in what the Lord is doing. May we never forsake a wholehearted dependence and reliance on the word of God to do the work of God. As he's promised it would, even in times of famine, what was once a house of bread where many would come to eat, may it appear to be a house of crumbs sometimes. But may we trust the Lord right where we are, relying on the work of the Spirit through his word to nourish the faith of his people. Well, let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the endless treasures that we find when we dig. I pray that you would continue to show us Christ through your word. And may your word do its work by the Spirit in our hearts to change us, to be the types of people who rely on you and respond to you as you've called us to. With gratitude and praise, we thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.